Hi, welcome to this webinar. This is an Explore More of Our Less series, and this is Training on the Road. Um, I'm Kate Wilson. I'll be your presenter today, and this was co-written with Caitlin Thomas's help. So, I really like this topic because um, I love to travel with my dogs, and all my dogs are reactive. So there's a couple things that we're going to kind of look at here for people who haven't maybe done as much um, taking your dog somewhere or you've never taken your dog to a hotel or to um, to the beach or to um, camping with your dog or canoeing because of because of the reactivity or um, or you tried it but there were some problems in there so before I even say let's go take all of our dogs out it's important to think about what dogs are really going to have fun outside and how are they how are they safe so we'll have a look at some of that some of the stuff that we'll be looking at um kind of what behaviors you can pre-train so that your dog is successful when you take them out things that, that will be helpful for you to know or that i learned over time were extremely helpful for my dogs to know in order for us to have a safe and fun trip um, how to do your transfer um transportation what what are safe ways for the dogs to be in the car um, and what kind of pre-training goes into that and then where you go so planning ahead um, things to bring first aid kits um, all the stuff that anybody who travels with a dog would do and then specific things that are helpful for people who have reactive dogs to be able to do so these outings are they can be overnight you could be talking about going to the park with your dog anything that you would be doing with your dog who is reactive away from home. And then this is, that was a picture of my foster dog on the way to get neutered. So away from home, we'll start there. So this is a, a photo that um, was taken of me with my dog Finnegan. So when he was younger, he was only about a year and a half and I took him up into the mountains of, um, Arizona and so we're up pretty high here and he did not have fun on that trip so he was already human reactive um, and dog reactive and it was too physically hard for him he didn't have enough training and he fell asleep on the top and I ended up not even going to the summit because I realized that he wasn't he was not having fun so from that, I really started to tailor what dogs I took where. I kind of grew up thinking that you could take your dogs with you everywhere and that every dog was going to have fun with you, no matter what you were doing. And after I adopted Finnegan, it was really um, a huge shift in sort of how I traveled with the dogs because it wasn't just bringing the dogs anywhere I wanted to go, but going places that I could go with that particular dog and that we both would have fun, sort of tailoring it to that individual instead of forcing them into my rut of what I wanted to do. Some dogs don't have fun even away from home and they don't have fun out of your yard. So for those dogs, the same rules apply. You don't force that dog to go to the park with you if that's somewhere they're really scared. I don't force those dogs to go for a walk with me around the block if that's something that is anxiety provoking for those dogs. And, and so in, inside of that, if the dog isn't having fun, if you see that they're stressed and I can't change the environment, the dogs are not, they're never wrong and they don't lie about those things. And um, as, our, as their guardians, we really control everything about the environment for them. And, and it doesn't have to be that those dogs go on those hikes. There are things that they can do that are just as fulfilling that you can do at home. And we just did our webinar on enrichment. And you can have a look at that because that's another way to really improve their quality of life through changing the home environment so they have access to a lot of behavior. This is a quick look at some things that you can do physically to exercise your dogs at home safely. So again, it's the, it's the um, trying to make the environment that they're in fulfilling with lots of things that they can do. So for a reactive dog, sometimes we have um, dogs that might be a risk even to hop a fence. So you have a fence and a long line on those dogs. And here is a dog playing fetch and he's got a long line. And I just keep it very, very loose make sure that they don't clothesline themselves to an open area where there's no rocks, no trees, no things they can get tangled up on, pick up all the chairs and stuff. So for those dogs, 
they can really get their physical needs out at home. Um, if it's something like adding a pool, then they can learn how to cool off in the pool. Um, you really want to make sure that they have a lot to do in the home environment. So those places in order for them to be safe, a solid fence is great. Those aren't always an option. So do a long line when it's appropriate. Um, and it's not the space, it's what you do in the space. So that's kind of the, that's a common theme in a lot of animal care. It's what are they doing? So if they are a dog who you feel would be happy on the road, you can try a small outing at first. You can first do your day outings, make sure they're very comfortable in every location, watch for things they can and cannot do. If you start to see they're afraid of roads, then add that to the list of, of things that you will have to remember about that dog, is they might be afraid of concrete for some reason. They might be afraid to walk in the grass. They might be afraid of other animals. That will start to tailor how I will change my trip to get the best out of it with the dog. Things that I might work on at home for overnights are behaviors the dog doesn't know how to use yet. So for any dog in any scenario, you want to have a safety recall in case something happens. They're leashed the whole time, but if they get off for some reason, I definitely don't want dogs that they get off leash and they dart and try to stay away from you. That's a dangerous situation for, for the dog to be in because it thinks it's a game or it thinks something bad's going to happen. Um, so recall is, would be like my first thing and the most important thing to work on is that if I need to protect my dog, I need them to trust me so they have to come back. Another really nice one for them to be comfortable with is crate training or training, training to a confined place. The reason this could be important is if there was some sort of an emergency or something happened um, and say you had to leave the dog in a hotel room for some reason, you have to have them in a crate if they're reactive because something can happen. And it's, there's ways around that. You can travel with more than one person. You can work around crate training. If, that, if you have a separation anxiety dog who also has confinement fear, you can work around that. But it's very handy to have. And if you do have it, we'll talk about ways that you actually get to use it. I want the dog to be comfortable with all of their gear. I don't want to pull it out, let's say booties, which are these little shoes that dogs wear, on the trip um, because they might be totally uncomfortable and then associate that with the booties. It really ruins their trip if they've never worn booties, don't know what it's like to have things on their feet and then we try it out on the trip. Same thing with a backpack. Maybe they all of a sudden are so uncomfortable in a harness or backpack that they won't move. Um, being leashed for some dogs is one of those things, having two points of contact, so two leashes, and being super comfortable in their muzzle if muzzle is part of their management plan. And, um, and you see here, this is Maddie. This is in the, the desert. So again, this is up in Arizona area and there are lots of sharp rocks and the dogs really for any longer hike in the mountains on rocks, on the trails, it's, you're okay if you're careful, um, but you really need booties for anything that's gonna be in the mountains because it wears their pads so fast. Even a dog with, who is used to running on concrete or a hard surface is going to have um, their feet cut up by the, the rocks. They're so sharp. But you get them ready ahead of hand. So when I put them on, they're going to be comfortable. It's not, it's not that I take, have to take a half hour to train them at that point in time. They already know how to do it. And it just gives both of you a little bit more enjoyment. So for transportation, what I'm, whatever you will be using to to move yourself, the dog needs to be acclimated beforehand to those things. So we have a dog in a crate, and so this is for transportation in the car. And then let's say I'm doing an overnight canoe trip, the dog needs to get in a canoe that's not moving before we get on the water. And I'm like, okay, we're all here, hop in the boat that you have no idea what we're doing, and the dog is afraid. So that you just set those, those kind of training scenarios up however you want. If it was for a canoe, I would probably start with things like being on a, a nonstick mat, and then I put the nonstick um, mat maybe somewhere so they can their feet will grip really well with it, and then you put that on something like a teeter totter or a wobble board, get them used to things moving underneath them, and then go to a boat, and then go to a non moving boat, then add your rocking, and then add your your water. So just getting the dog ready for it step by step, depending on kind of where your dog is, just be sure that when you get there, that um, that you actually get to follow through with the trip, and that you guys have enough training under your belts that you're going to be successful. Here are some options on ways you can transport the dogs. So in, if you're traveling and the dogs are in the car, the biggest thing I worry about is um, heat stroke. 
The next thing is car crashes. So um, here is one of my reactive dogs up in the, the top corner here. And he's in the front seat. And the only reason he's in the front seat is because this car is not moving. <laughs> I took the picture from the back seat. He doesn't ever sit in the front seat when we're moving because he's a 130 pound reactive dog. So that goes for the five pound reactive dog too. You don't want a distraction while you're driving because potentially you both can create a hazard from that. So underneath that, there's some options for different crate alignments. What I don't want is a crate that tips. That's pretty much, I want a crate that breathes. Um, I wanna be able to have the dog be able to lay down very comfortably. Um, and I just, I don't want it to be scary and move around when you make your turns. So you can do things, you can affix it to the floor. Um, there are some that separate dogs from each other. And this can just be a little bit easier if one dog doesn't like the other one to lie down on top of it. Or if you want to give them both a high value of food, you don't want them to fight over it. Um, and then it gets different levels of sort of sturdiness and handiness and what you can do. So you can kind of see over here, all the way on the right, you have two crates and they are, um, tied with eye hooks and then um, they're tied to the bottom of the car. So there's these little places where the seat belts hook or the, or the seats will hook and you can ratchet down the crate so that it doesn't move back and forth in the car. And I just want to do that because it makes the dog anxious in a crate if that's what's happening. For dogs who are very reactive to other dogs or people or even uh, motorcycles or trucks, you can cover the crate and you can have music on so that they have less of an idea of when the diesel engine is coming. And, um, and then I obviously air conditioning if it's very hot. I really want to make sure if the dogs are in a crate and the crate is covered, that they're in a cool environment. And I never would leave them in the crate for even a second with the car off and me walking away from the car. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna let them out of the crate, I can leave the car running, I go to the back, I can open up the crate, get the dog out, go back around, turn the car off just so that you don't have this dead time while they're in the crate panting. You really don't want um, to put the dog under heat stress and it can be fatal fairly quickly. So it's something you have to be very careful about. So let's say you have a human reactive dog and you wanna travel with them and you're thinking like, how do I do that safely? So, and this is the same thing if, if you get in a car accident and you have a human reactive dog, how do you make sure your dog is gonna be safe? Um, oh, shoot. So I think we'll come to that. I thought that was the next slide. So there's things that you can do. You can get locks for them and you can put, um, you can put instructions on your crate. So let's say if you had a dog who was human aggressive and you're in a car accident, first responder goes to the back to get your dog out. First thing they see is do not open. And then in a case of emergency, call this number. So then you have your safety person in come to pick up the dog in that scenario. And then, and then after that, because that's really the most important information, if they need to know more, I can add more information after this. Um, human aggression, da, 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 whatever you want to put on there. But the most important thing is don't open this crate and call this person if there's an accident. And that's to keep the person safe and your dog safe. A lot of dogs after a car accident are going to bolt out of the car because they're so scared and they get hit by other cars and a lot of things like that. So even for the dog who maybe doesn't have that type of aggression or reactivity, you don't really, if it's not necessary, want someone to open up a crate and get the dog out. And so I leave instructions of what I would like to have happen to the dog in, in that scenario. So for a population of our dogs, even getting in the car is gonna be one of the things you train on. For other dogs, so you can see this picture up here on the right, they all, what their ideal place to be in a car ride would be in the front seat, preferably on top of each other. Um, it's not really appropriate way to drive because if anything happens, even if a dog just gets surprised and falls off, you're in a hazard situation. So either having, um, the crate, the grate up behind you, so they can they can be all in the back seats and say there's seat belts and things like that they can do, but not in the front where they're really interfering um, with you. And then we have how to get them up into the car. So older dogs or very large breed dogs might need ramps or stairs. Um, little dogs, as they especially as they age, are going to need stairs, um, stools, something they can jump on to get in, or trained to, to jump up. Um, this was my dog, Kane, and he's waiting for me to put his rear end in. So he would just get his front legs in and then wait because he couldn't get up by himself. 
And then, and that's sort of assisted, I'll help them physically like run up to the crate and help lift them. And then actually this middle photo is a photo of a dog who was taken from a hoarding situation and the person with the leash doesn't know the dog. And so you can kind of see they're holding it tight and the other person's picking the dog up. You, that's, I don't want to pull a dog up by their neck. So whichever of these things you use, make sure it's really powered by the dog or if they're giving you consent over moving them and they want to be pushed in further. Um, and remember as your dog's age, their mobility will decrease. So things they can maybe do when they were one and a half, two, three, four, they're not gonna be able to do when they're eight, nine, 10. Um, so getting them used to stairs and ramps can be something that's pretty helpful even, even early on. So the next stage, let's say they're ready, they have the behaviors that I want them to have, um, that, that they're, they're ready to really take their training on the road, where do you go? So I want to plan ahead. Not all places will accept dogs, although that's changing drastically. There's lots of places out west and even really nice parks now. And then in the south, there's a lot of state land. So places like Kentucky and Tennessee and, and Florida, people take their dogs with them a lot when they're traveling. And so there's a lot of places camping and a lot of state forests that will allow them. The hotels that will take them, parks that can take them, camping, and there's beaches where you can take just dogs. Um, for safety, a good understanding of what first first aid is and the weather conditions in the area that you're traveling to and dangerous plants and animals. And this can be things like cactuses and rattlesnakes and stuff like that. And then training that goes along with that. And we'll have a look at these. So planning ahead. This is, if I say I'm going to take an overnight, I will look at a list of hotels I know to be dog friendly. I might call ahead and ask them. Um, if those are places that are um, dog friendly. So if they say yes, then the next thing I need to ask is, is there a deposit I have to pay? Because some places will say, um, yes, you can come to this hotel, but um, it's a hundred dollar deposit and that type of thing. So if I'm gonna go to a park, um, I already know that almost every national park will not allow dogs outside of the parking lots or camping areas. So they're great if you're driving through or you're gonna be camping in like Glacier or Yellowstone, but they don't want dogs on the trails out there. Um, dogs, all of the reasons, because there's a large population of people that might travel with their dogs. Some people who take their dogs off leash, worrying about dogs barking at animals, worrying about dogs attacking animals. There's all of those reasons that national parks don't allow dogs. Um, and that's something that you just respect the rules of those parks and then go to the parks that do allow dogs. So this is another one in Arizona where dogs are allowed to summit the peaks and camp on the, on the trails. Um, and there's a lot of places like that. And there are a lot of great websites that will tell you um, which places, which parks, which state land can you go hiking with dogs. And there's some really great groups that you can get into also for hiking with dogs. Um, I'm very, um, consider it that I have a domesticated animal and I'm moving into a natural area. I don't want my dogs barking and lunging at deer. I might take some pre-training for some dogs. Um, I can work on that before I go if I know that's an issue. And I just generally am respectful with my, with my dogs. I don't let the dogs go up and meet people. Don't allow other dogs to meet your dogs on the trail. Move off the trail if you can to get people, let people pass you. Um, Always keep your dog leashed in these parks. One, the dogs don't know where they are. The worst thing that can happen is they get lost. Um, it should be, it should be some, something that's safe, not that ends in a disaster. Uh, and they don't know what the animals are. Dogs don't know that snakes are poisonous. So if you go somewhere where there are snakes, you need to be aware that your dog doesn't understand that potentially and that they might stick their nose under a rock or something and find something like a scorpion or a snake. So you're just, you're just aware of that. I just keep an eye on what they're doing and when they're doing it. Um, and, and in that regard, know that things like snakes will be a harder, they have a harder time and they bite more when it's cold because they can't get away. So a hot snake is more mobile and they'll be able to move and they're more likely to be in a shady place at that point of the day where the cold snakes will be on the trail in the morning. So if you're doing morning hikes, I keep an eye on the trail in front of me and around me. Just, just scan it um, to make sure that your dog is okay. Um, so I'm respectful to the animals in the park. Maybe if I see an animal and I have a dog, I might wait for that deer to cross the trail and then keep walking with him. 
have a plan for how you're going to proceed if your dog is dog reactive or human reactive and you run into a dog or a human, does your dog already know what to do on the trail? So one of the things that I do with my dogs before on the trail is I run off the trail. So I keep them in my mind, where are places I can step off the trail so these people can pass me? And so we see a person on the trail and we say this way and I just walk through the woods this way with the dog and the dogs follow me through the woods. They get treats the whole time. The person keeps walking and then we go back to the trail. So it could also be this way and we go off the trail and I play with sticks and we have fun and the person goes and we come back. And it just becomes a routine until the dog sees a person and they're like, oh, we go off the trail and they run off the trail. So whatever behavior you practice when they see somebody, that's part of your reactivity plan. That will help you a little bit. Um, so the last thing, and this will be in, in all of the safety stuff, is always have your water ready. So there are many hotels now that are pet friendly and that will accept multiple breeds. It's important to ask for what kind of breeds. So my dog Finnegan is a German Shepherd um, Bull Mastiff, which are often two of the breeds that are banned um, in, in a lot of parks and um, campgrounds and hotels. They often will have a list of breeds they might not accept. So when I ask, when I call, I ask, do they have any, do they, do they discriminate against breeds? Do they have any breeds that are not allowed, basically? I don't usually say discriminate because that would already starts to insinuate that I'm mad. <laughs> um, so I ask about the fees and deposits. I make sure that the dogs are going to come in. Sometimes if you, if you are going out and you're hiking a whole bunch and you go back to a hotel, I try to clean the dog off before they go. You might not allow the dogs on the beds if they're dirty or if they're, if they're shedding. Um, those types of things are harder for people to clean up, and sometimes there's an extra charge for if there's hair on the floor or anything. If I have to give the dog a bath, I try it again, clean it up before, towel them off before, send them right to the bathroom, and then I clean the area after I leave. So just be very considerate because the reason that dogs are welcome in that hotel or establishment is because they don't have bad experiences with them. And each time you travel with your dog, the experiences people have with you and your dog will dictate how they feel about future dogs traveling to those locations. I make sure I bring comfortable beds and a crate if I need to for those dogs, if I'm leaving them anytime or if I'm traveling by myself. Um, and I might, depending on your dogs, at, at, there was a time when Finnegan was much younger and he's a shepherd mastiff. He was so reactive that I would run him muzzled from my car to the hotel. So we would wait for there to be a clear, like clear, and then I just run him right in. And I had a muzzle because it was close quarters. And if somebody opened a door for whatever reason and I wasn't ready, there would be problems. There never were, and I was very careful. And over time, his reactivity decreased to the point that he doesn't have that issue anymore. He doesn't have a, that intense reactivity to strangers. So I can, I can now move him from the car and then just go straight to the hotel. He does have issues going upstairs. He can't go upstairs very fast. So you might ask for things like, do you have a lower room available or a lower room that's maybe um, facing away from a public, like the rooms in the back might be really great if you have dogs who are reactive. Um, but you can go ahead of time and kind of look for rooms that might be um, less traffic, easier for your dog to go in and out. A lot of rooms have their own access points in the back, and so you can do something like that and, um, and make it so that you're more successful. The dog has less interactions, and you can go back and forth between the car fairly easy with your dog and not have to worry about running into people. So if you're camping, um, I... I try to bring a tent that's going to be for the number of dogs and people I have, not just the number of people. So the dogs will want to sleep in the tent with you, and they take up about as much space as a person. So this was camping with two people and two dogs, and so we have a four-person tent. So the dogs can sleep in the tent with us, and they're not taking up a ton of space. If I do a two-person tent, then your dogs are basically have to sleep on top of you, and none of you are going to sleep very well. And sleep is going to be really important to keeping the dogs from becoming very stressed and more reactive as time goes on. You also need to bring enough water for, if you have two people and two dogs, you need to bring four people's worth of water. The dogs are gonna need all of that water too. And so you can see here, there's like four gallons of water and this is just an overnight trip. It's also important to note that no reactive dog is, is going to be held in by a tent if something they're reacting to is outside. So that's, you can kind of see in this picture, that's Maddie, the cow dog, and she's in the middle of that tent. 
we're in the middle of the woods. There's nothing else going on. That's the only reason she's still in the tent. If a dog walked past, she could just explode out of the screen. So when you have a dog in the tent, the tent is not a crate. If, you, if you're in a situation where you're going to leave the dog in, in a camping area, don't even, don't go camping because you can't leave your dog alone. You can't tie them to a tree. You can't just take off or something. You really are going to have your buddy with you at all times while you're up there. Um, and then the dog food. Sometimes I have the dogs carry that in their own backpack. Um, if I'm in the, in the campground and I'm not going anywhere, your dog can be on a long line. Um, if you're using a long line, I try to attach it to a body harness, something so they don't hurt themselves. And I'm still scanning the environment so they don't bark or they don't lunge at anything. If they are a dog who you think would just go full out for something like a chicken or a deer, or if they saw a person or a dog, the long line is not going to be one of the things that, that you want to use. Uh, probably two points of contact and attached to you would be wise for those situations. Um, if you're in a situation where the dog is reacting over and over, that type of, of camping is too intense for them. And so you might look for op options to camp alone. So in this scenario here, I, I had two reactive dogs. And so I'm camping somewhere where there are no other campers. You can find places that are kind of backcountry camping locations. You can take the dog and you can camp there. And, um, and your chances of running into people are very low and they're not constantly being exposed to people. At this point, because we've done so much traveling with the dogs, they both can now be in a regular campground where there's other people, but not, they have to be the campground, the distance between them maybe 50 feet apart. But that's something that you learn about your dogs, how they can do and how they can handle and the kind of stress they can be under uh, for those situations. They're often having so much fun doing everything else that your time at home or at the campground might not be very extensive. And you can also do things to mitigate that. So you're traveling, you're canoeing, you're doing stuff, hiking outside, you go back to the campground at night. Um, if you have a dog who is startling to sound, then camping might not be as easy for them in a, in a high traffic area. So just consider the traffic when you're picking a spot for your particular dog and how they react. Sometimes the hotel is easier because you can have um, the sound on the TV and it doesn't interfere with everybody else. So they don't hear a person like knocking or going up the stairs and that kind of stuff. And then be aware that because they're camping and because they're not at home, for some of the dogs, they will be accumulating stress by doing that. So it really depends on the type of reactivity and who your dog is. But let's say they had one really rough night where they didn't get any sleep, they might be more reactive the next day. So really, I take into consideration, how is this trip affecting my dog in terms of stress? You should get a good idea by, are they eating? Do they, are they behaving normally? Has their reactivity changed in some way? So just really be aware of those things and then plan around your dog. Beaches can be a fantastic place for dogs. Um, one of the things that's hard to find is places where there are um, leash rules and no other off-leash dogs. So people will always be tempted to take their dogs to a park and let them off leash, even if there is a six foot leash rule. So I usually go with another person and I have the person scope out the, the actual beach and see if there are loose dogs out there. And then again, I do all the things you would in the city. You plan your escape routes. If somebody comes, where do I go? What do I do? And um, and then if all is well, you can have your dogs go out on leash and go see the beach. Um, always clean up after yourself in those situations. The, the reason that dogs are allowed there or the reason that they're also not allowed in other places is that people are so concerned about dogs leaving poop behind. And so making sure that we're respectful and that we're clean, really make sure that, that future dogs can visit those beaches. Um, for dogs who love the water, just like a, a side warning, because there's some dogs who, who love beaches and they love to bite the water, don't let them eat the water indefinitely because what will happen is they will get water intoxication. So some of the herding breeds will, will run up and down the beach and they're barking at the waves and they're chomping the waves and then they start throwing up water, but they can actually drink too much water. Uh, so I just keep an eye on it. The repetitive behaviors are something just try to keep under control, find other things for them to do. If you're throwing fetch for your dog, you need to be very careful about things like riptides. So riptides are where the waves come in to the beach and then they channel back out through a low spot. And this channel right here, that channel is fast moving water. And so if an animal gets caught in a riptide, it pulls them out. Usually beaches will have a sign that says riptides. And if they do, then just don't play fetch with the dog. You wanna keep them you know, where they're comfortable 
Um, your dog would be on a long line in those scenarios anyway, so you'd be able to move them out, but I'm still really careful because um, it's a lot of, um, of danger unnecessarily for a dog who really enjoys the water. Um, if your dog has, has been in water and really loves water and loves the lakes in Michigan or wherever they live, and you go to the ocean, they will think the ocean is fresh water and they'll try to drink it. So I'm just aware of that. I make sure I have water available for them. And if they start to drink it, call them back to drink regular water and just realize that they're not, they don't know that by themselves necessarily. Um, and anywhere where there are, like in, in Michigan area, if you're hiking with dogs along the beach, remember the dunes are really fragile. Stay on the trails with your dogs. So the dogs, of course, they could go anywhere. It's a little bit harder to walk in the sand, but re um, kind of just make sure that the, the land that we're in is being protected and kind of like just round back up on be respectful of the parks that we're in that we're dogs are allowed there because the dogs before us were being very polite and so we really owe the dogs of the future the same where the dogs sleep and how much they sleep is so important to how much fun they have so they're just like us they get stressed out and cranky if they don't get enough sleep and i want to make sure that i bring the proper dog beds for them that our downtime is relaxing that if they're sleeping in a tent, that they're in a comfortable, warm place. If they need to have blankets for your tent, make sure you bring blankets for the tent. Stuff so that I know that the dog is um, sleeping well, is sleeping warmly, and is waking up rested. And this is Maddie, and she's sleeping in the car at a lunch break. And she just, I brought a sleeping bag out and made a little bed for her. And she's, she's great. She falls asleep anywhere. So have a look at safety. You have your, your management gear and your first aid. And here's a sort of a picture of, um, from a camping site with camping with dogs and all the things that you could use for um, yourself and for your dog when you're going camping. So this is like a little uh, a dog bed that you can bring with you. It's a collapsible dog bed. You have the person's sleeping bag, you have their boots, you have their all of their gear, and then on the side you have the dog's gear. You have a medical first aid kit for your dog, there's treats for your dog, there's delicious food for your dog, there's booties and leashes, um, everything that your dog's going to need, um, and a backpack. So the dog can usually have the dog carry their own dry kibble. It's not too heavy, you don't want to weigh down your dogs very much. If you have a large breed dog, I just assume I carry it. I don't, they're already carrying their body, I don't want to um, put unnecessary stress on their on their body. So here's a few things to go into your safety or your management um, kit. So when it's appropriate, if you're if you have a dog who is will bite other dogs or a dog who has bitten or will bite humans, a muzzle, muzzle train beforehand so that it's not a surprise event. Here I have Jake who was a pointer and he was very he was good people, very dog aggressive. So in case another dog ran up on us, he's muzzled. Um, in long line, even though we're in a nature area and there's I don't see anybody. Um, and he's got a backpack on in that picture. Um, poop bags, make sure again, we're, we're, we clean up and we're respectful with the environment. Bring your collapsible bowls, things that the dogs will, I really offer water frequently when we're outside. So bring your food and water and think of, they need water as frequently as we do. So offer it whenever, um, whenever it would occur to you to drink some water. You want lights in case you're out at night. So um, you can get these lights that go on their tags. Uh, you can put lights on their backpacks, you can put lights on um, their harnesses. Lights will help you when you're moving around at night. I have a flashlight so that I can um, keep track of the trail and where we are. A tick remover in areas where you might be running into ticks, which is like everywhere now. So some way tweezers or a little key, a tick key that can remove the ticks for you if you catch them. And I do like a, a, maybe a, a check every time I go through a ton of tall grass something that I try to catch them before they've bitten the dog so they're still crawling on the outside of the fur and I just do a visual inspection and then keep going you know just I just watch everyone's smells you're just mindful of those things it's not like you're living in fear you're just mindful that there could be those things happening and so um, to prevent the actual bite from happening I just scan them briefly your leashes your booties your long line your harness if you have um, a dog who's going out and they have a, a, a basic um, collar, but maybe it's a breakaway collar. I consider some way to get secure dog tags and, and microchip your dog if it's not already microchipped. So that if something happened for whatever reason and something failed and they got away, 
you get your you can get your you can get to your dog again you get them back um, and then a backpack for your management gear and so this is the set of gear that you'll use on a typical overnight camping trip if you were going to a park or something with your dog um, this little um, list would also work for a day trip all of these things are things you could take with you on a day trip for safety Again, the thing I worry most about is overheating. So I worry about it in the car, I worry about it on the trail, I worry about it in the sun, I worry about it when you're biking, I worry about it when you're jogging. I'm always looking for, are the dogs getting too hot? And they often get hot really fast, and we are people who like to, to work out in the middle of the day, and it's hottest in the middle of the day. So make sure that there is water available, and I often will plan my hikes or my trips around locations where there, where there is water for the dog, water for them to get into, so they can jump in up to their waist. Um, some dogs will dunk their face underwater, and I train that as a pre-behavior. So you kind of see up here at the top, we have four dogs around the pool, and the pool is full of water. I train the dogs to jump in the water and jump out of the water, jump in the water, and then I just say, okay, go get in the water, and they jump in the water, and then I throw their tennis ball. What I want is that when I find water on a job, I say, go get in the water, and they run down, jump in the water, and then we can keep running. Um, it's a really handy behavior and a fast way to cool a dog down. You don't really put the water on top of their back. They're not quite like us. The hair on their body is made to insulate them from the sun, where if they get wet, dogs will put the, get their legs wet. That's a lot of surface area for them. So that's like as much surface area as there would be on their entire back. It's just four legs wet. And then they get under their chest wet usually. So the neck and the chest area around where the heart is underneath their arms. That's the stuff that I will get wet if I'm going to get it wet. And if they're overheating for some reason outside, you can pour water in your hand and you do the same thing. You get that place wet. You wet their front arms, you wet their back arms, you wet places where, it's, where there is not as much hair or the hair is very fine. There's also something that Rough Wear makes, which is a reflective um, kind of cooling jacket that, for black dogs. So if you own a black dog, you know that they get um, hot much faster than the white dogs. Um, and they're, they get hot to the touch just, just from the, the, um, the sun hitting the fur. So you can get reflective jackets for those dogs that because dogs don't sweat through their skin, having those jackets on doesn't suffocate them the way that it does us where we feel like if you have something over your skin, you're not getting rid of much heat for the dog. It will help reflect some of that. And I've used that for some of my dogs for day hikes, for things like that. For dogs who are very tiny, so we have down here all the way in the corner, we have a little chihuahua and a red jacket. For dogs who are super tiny, you can get things to keep them warmer. So this is early spring, and um, this is a very small dog, and small dogs are going to be losing a lot more. They have more surface area to body mass. They lose their, their um, the heat a little bit faster, and so I might consider putting um, something on those dogs to help keep the heat in for them. So if you... Um, if you choose to use the coat, make sure you have your dog in locations that are safe because the coats could get hung up on something. And I'm just, I'm just thinking about that, I'm just aware of it. The last dog on here is the Svisha, who's running with the orange um, jacket. So those dogs um, that will be hiking during hunting season, I have wear orange. And it's just in case. Um, if you're outside during hunting season, no matter what state you're in, just have some bright colors on you to help differentiate you and your dog from the surrounding environment. It's, um, it's something that I just have handy. It's just part of their gear. So you can put it on there, just being aware that um, bright orange is much easier for a hunter to see and you won't get accidentally um, fired upon. So first aid kit. and your first aid kit, you think tweezers, you want bandaging, you want your disinfectants, you want any medication that your dog's going to be taking, you want extras of that medication, you want the extras in a sealed bag in case like the whole thing fell in the water. Um, and you get things, you can get things like Benadryl in case there was an allergic reaction to something. You can talk to your vet about what types of things your dog might need. I'm thinking um, if they break a nail, being able to clip the nail off, like that type of stuff. You really want to make sure that you have the things that you need to be able to take care of your dog if something goes wrong. So make sure you're bringing water. <laughs> I've gone over this entire um, webinar. Just be very careful with the heat. That's the thing that I worry most about is, um, is the heat stroke for dogs. Um, there's also, um, this, is the this is the reflective swamp cooler. 
There's also a, um, a jacket that Roughwear makes that you can put water on and it will evaporate. So that's something that you can use for dogs with short coats that need to have an extra, um, it's, it's basically allowing them to sweat because of that. And then if I'm traveling far from home, I make sure that I have contacted an alternative vet or emergency vet that in case my dog got bit by a rattlesnake, in case they broke a leg or they strained something or I need medication for something or they got um, porcupine quill, that I know a vet that I can take my dog to in that location. Nothing should feel like an intense emergency if you plan everything out ahead of time. I think it's like traveling with kids. <laughs> so that's it for this one. Thank you so much. And I think the, the biggest part that is the most important to me is that because you have a reactive dog doesn't mean that you are limited in some way for the things you can do. You have to do them differently and you have to make sure you go at the speed of your dog. Um, and that they're having fun with you. And if the dog isn't having fun, just be prepared to change your plans. It, the most important part and thing that you'll remember um, when you think back on that trip is that you and your dog took the trip together. It's not necessarily all the places you went, it's the things that you did. Thank you. <laughs>